Okay. Good afternoon, everyone here at uh, NEWA in Auckland and to uh, viewers uh, online. Uh, my name is Ian Longley. I lead the uh, Air Quality Research Program at NEWA. Uh, and also, uh, I've put together the International Wood Smoke Researchers Network. Uh, and one of the events of that network is we bring uh, researchers interested in wood smoke from around the world to New Zealand to, to share our, our knowledge and our plans and uh, research going forward. Uh, today, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Amanda Wheeler. So Dr. Wheeler has come to us from the University of Tasmania. Uh, she's previously worked at uh, Health Canada for an extended period of time, working on human exposure, personal exposure to air pollutants. Uh, a short stint at Edith Cowan University in Perth, now University of Tasmania. And she's going to tell us about a little bit of research, which is very much of interest here to us in, in New Zealand, uh, about how we enable people to learn about and understand their own uh, exposure to uh, air pollutants and how we can learn more through engagement through citizen science. So over to uh, Amanda. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for coming today uh, at such short notice and uh, for joining us online. And uh, thank you very much to Ian for the invitation and to get the opportunity to meet with everybody at NEWA and hopefully build some collaborations. Um, I work with Faye Johnson, who provided a seminar, I think, in April. Um, and so I thought I'd just give a little bit of background um, to the group and uh, some of the work that we're doing and then talk uh, a little bit more in depth about the aerator project um, and in the end i'll just i'll talk about a uh, potential collaboration that we're, we're planning so i'm a research fellow um, i'm funded by the center for air quality and health research and evaluation uh, CAR for short um, they're a center for research excellence funded by nhmrc and uh, Sorry, technical. Oh. Okay. All right. Um, so some of the background, um, I'll talk about uh, the Environmental Health Group at Menzies Institute for Medical Research at the University of Tasmania. Um, and then a little bit more about the area the project, uh, how it functions, um, smoke, pollen, heat, and, and how we've evaluated users' um, uptake and some of the future plans for the group as well. So it's just a sort of point of interest uh, for the audience. The background to the environmental health research that has been conducted that Faye is leading um, and I'm part of is, is a combination of many years of uh, being involved in a, a lot of different projects and, and issues that are related to public health. And um, so a lot of the work that she has done has been within sort of the landscape fire and heat wave um, arena. She's also done a lot of work related to allergens, um, sort of hay fever. Um, as a sort of uh, mainly, I think, to the uh, huge personal and economic impacts that that has. Um, she's presented to this group, I think, on the wood heater work that uh, she had done in Launceston, um, and that's kind of where I fit, I think, more with the group uh, in terms of doing monitoring and measurement of uh, air quality and indoor air quality as well. And so the air rate is kind of evolved from a lot of the work that she's been doing with David Bowman and um, who's a fire ecologist um, and so Aerator kind of brings together um, exposures to pollens and fire and heat and you can sort of um, add in your symptom data and understand a little bit more about the environmental hazards that are perhaps causing reductions in your health. Going forward the environmental health group will be sort of working to develop a, a smoke emissions lab um, and I'll talk a little bit about that towards the end as well. 
So in terms of the aerated team, it's quite an expensive team, um, multidisciplinary, and um, a lot of them from the University of Tasmania, with um, input from EPA Tasmania, CSIRO, and ANU as well. Um, I've been the sort of project coordinator, and so uh, herding cats would perhaps be a good description of my job. <laughs> um, but it's been great to have uh, really engaged individuals and expertise um, in a range of different fields. Um, truly is multidisciplinary. So in Tasmania, we know that um, many of the diseases such as asthma, hay fever, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and heart disease and stroke um, exist and they they are made worse by environmental conditions and that's been proven in the literature and so we knew that there was we wanted to do something to uh, assist people um, to con try and better self-manage their health. So Aerator brings together a lot of different components and the next slide will sort of show you how it kind of fits together but we wanted to incorporate real-time environmental data along with health surveillance so that individuals could better manage their health and, and also public health could better manage the situations in the community that were occurring as a result of um, degradations in environmental conditions. So this next slide's a little bit busy, um, but I just wanted to sort of give you some context as to how it, the platform for Aerator really fits together. Um, there's a lot of different functional components and uh, the scientific collaborators are kind of the list of people that, are, that make up the Aerator team. And as you can see, you know, from clinical medicine due to IT and data, you know, with a wide range of expertise uh, in between. We also rely really heavily on um, collaborators. So we, we had this um, a reference group. And so we invited the EPA, Public Health, um, Tasmanian Fire Service, different healthcare providers, Asthma Foundation, and they, we met with them on a regular basis, so at least twice a year, so that we could actually get their input on how we were rolling this out, what use it would be to them, how we could be, uh, we could design things better. So it's been really, I think, a good foundation for the project. Like we've been responsive to their input, so I think that's that's really made it applicable and, and widely used. In terms of Aerator itself, there's a, a big sensor network which we use the um, to EPA Tasmania blanket system. So there's 34 um, air monitoring stations across Tasmania uh, measuring PM 2.5 um, along with meteorological data. We also have the Bureau of Meteorology inputting data. We developed the app and the, the sort of analytics and software that go into that um, to generate alerts for individuals um, along with the web tools. And then the individual can interact with the app and put in how they're feeling. Um, so then it kind of, it's just sort of feedback on itself so that they can understand this, what's happening to their health. In terms of users, um, a wide range of individuals and agencies have uh, used it for a range of different um, reasons, um, whether it's to sort of understand the impacts of any planned burns or bushfires, uh, or whether it's to sort of provide public health advice and alerts. So I've got a short video that was made um, for one of the, the I Awards. We were fortunate enough to be the winners of the state I Award and the uh, runners up for the national I Award, uh, which is about innovation. So we just, it's a bit of a, a sell, but uh, it kind of gives you the context for how it fits together. <laughs> Designed for people with asthma, hay fever, or other health problems, it may worse by environmental conditions such as smoke, hunger, heat, or pollution. It lets users identify the triggers of their symptoms and helps them avoid those triggers. It can do better for a quality of life. The air rate of the next phase of reading health symptoms can back your anxiety on a range of environmental conditions. A person experiencing symptoms such as sneezing, itchy eyes, or shortness of breath can enter the app. These health reports are then combined with real time weather and air quality data that gathered from 34 EPA Tasmanian smoke monitoring stations across the state, and with data from six strategically located polling centres. These samples are examined to determine the types and proportions of different polling centres. Now, the processing of all this data results in a number of important benefits to users. For one thing, it allows them to identify the triggers that cause their symptoms like never been possible before. By 
mapping the user symptoms over time in order to generate the personal database of environmental habits and reveal further hits, for example, cold air, smoke, or pollen from cancer products when it's that of the user illness. Then, after every event of the health of the managed the health. With elevated levels of environmental triggers are present to the forecast, we have to notify users so we can adjust their behavior to avoid harm. Finally, action, such as the taking of medication or the changing of exercise plans, greatly reduces the personal and social impact of living with a chronic disease. Airways also assist the music like health patients by allowing them to prepare harms of risky environmental conditions, such as bushfires and heat waves. Airways is accurate, time specific, location specific, and personalized. It is the ultimate innovative solution for heat and air pollution reduced health problems. So yes, a bit of a sell at the end, sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, so when an individual um, has the app loaded on their phone or on their desktop, um, there's a number of different screens that they can see. So I thought I'd just show you a few examples. Every sixth day, we actually send a reminder if we haven't heard from the individual. Um, it, it, there was a lot of back and forth about pestering people and being a nuisance, and, but there's also the need from a science perspective to understand there aren't symptoms. So if an individual isn't sick, that's important to us as well. So we wanted to try and capture that information. So they would get a prompt, do you have any symptoms right now? Or alternatively, they could actually put in where they are and report their symptoms. And then you actually have um, the option to put in your actual location, the date and time, which part of the body is it impacted. So in this situation, we've got nose moderately impacted and my symptoms are I have a runny nose. So they could add in other issues. So if they have migraines or things like that, they can add in their own symptom as well. Um, so it's not just the, the, the typical eye, lung, throat. <laughs> You then get back information about, um, at the bottom of the screen, you can see that there's information on the environmental hazards of interest. So um, PM 2.5, which in Tasmania typically is smoke, um, pollen, uh, in this situation it's total pollen, and then temperature as well. You can actually track um, what's happening to the environment and in, in the location that you're at over time, so you could do this for a three month period, week or a day. Um, and so you can also look at pollen by family. We actually measure 25 different taxa um, and report total and then five of the most allergenic ones that um, we know of. So here you have examples of um, associations between symptoms and the environment. And so you can start seeing where those associations are and understanding what's triggering uh, your symptom, your specific symptoms. So we have the five different um, pollen species at the top, and um, we have the environmental conditions uh, on the screen below. You can also track um, pollution, and the PM 2.5 and the temperature, um, and see how that's changing over time um, as well. So we're trying to make it as interactive so that, as possible so that people can kind of understand what's going on around them um, and, and link everything back to their health and what's causing them issues. So at the moment, um, we started in October 2015 and we have over 3,000 users all over Tasmania. Um, of those users, 881 have signed up to be study participants so we can actually interact with them. Get, send them surveys, ask them questions. Um, and we know from those individuals that roughly half have asthma, um, more have hay fever, uh, allergies, some have both. And some people are using it to um, track the health of either their child or maybe their parent um, so that they can assist them. And so these, you know, the app is kind of targeted at people with symptoms and illnesses. So um, we would expect to have a higher than normal uh, number of these people with the, um, these chronic diseases. 
We also, you know, have done evaluations. We've done three evaluations, which I'll talk to in a little bit, um, just to sort of see how people are using the app and what's going on, how we can improve things for people. So this next video is uh, from a user that agreed to explain why he's using the app and just to give people some ideas of how useful it is for people. I've been in the area now for approximately a year, I would say, and it really helped me to avoid situations where I have to breathe in too much smoke or pollution. So I'm a leaky harbour, which just makes my safe generation. The reason the inequality affects me is the smoke can sometimes prohibit how much oxygen gets into my own street. So I use the inverter app to tell me when there are a lot of smoke particles in the air. I use the app just by opening up my top phone and then I can drop anywhere in Tasmania and it will tell me how much smoke is in the air at that time. Being able to check where the smoke is um, really helps me um, a plan in advance so that I don't get chest pain, dizziness, lack of concentration, and the various other problems that come um, with breathing in too much smoke. The ear rate app is actually really important to me. It really helps me um, to avoid some um, exacerbated medical conditions. <laughs> The only thing I wish you could do is if I could pick me up anywhere in Australia before I travel to stay. He's a believer, what can I say? <laughs> I think so uh, in terms of what we've learned uh, about the Tasmania environment, um, we have uh, we've been tracking smoke and pollen over time um, and also uh, individual symptoms and so in terms of smoke, there have been a few episodes in Tasmania that you may have been aware of. Um, in January 2016, uh, we had a lot of uh, peat and bushfire smoke, um, specifically in the north of the island. And uh, that, that was quite problematic because it was peat um, that was burning as well. So there's a lot of smouldering um, and a lot of smoke that was coming through. Um, and then we sort of, we looked at data from the symptoms that were reported in Launceston, which is in the north of the island, versus uh, Hobart. Um, and so, well, actually, you know, this, this slide just shows the Launceston data. So you can see during that period of the fire in January 2016, there were high um, elevations in the PM 2.5 that exceeded the air quality standard. And then there was corresponding symptom reporting that was in increased for that time period. So. A lot of people were reporting eye, lung, and nose uh, irritation uh, for that period from the smoke. So it's interesting. To, it was good to see that we were It was responding to an environmental hazard. Um, in terms of other um, pollutants, we obviously look at the pollen. As the video said, we have six pollen monitors uh, across Tasmania. Um, this is our fourth site, site and. Um, it's a very manual process, I will say that. Um, you have to take a slide every day, look at it under the microscope, do a count, and then we post that data um, every day. So, you know, future plans are to try and get in some forecasting and automate that a little bit more. The instruments on the market right now are either massively expensive that seem to work or hopeless. And they're no association at all to what we're trying to measure. <laughs> so we're kind of stuck at the moment, but uh, we're, we're working, um, we put some down applications in to look at using satellite data, vegetation data, GIS, uh, to look at the spatial coverage of different vegetations and try and um, build up some of the work that we're doing um, and validating it with the different pollen monitors that we've got out in the field. And what has been interesting is, um, I've just got data for three sites, Hobart, Launceston, and Forsyth. And, and what's been interesting is that you know there are differences in the same time period in terms of which uh, pollen taxa are prevalent, um, and that sort of changes day to day. And um, it kind of demonstrates to us that, that you need to think of pollen fairly locally, um, which I think, um, given its manual uh, process at the moment makes it expensive and difficult to do. Um, but certainly sort of the, the evidence here suggests that it does vary. A lot of cities have one pollen monitor um, and that's it.
and they say that's representative. And a lot of people, you know, just measure graphs um, as well. So I think, you know, we'll have some interesting data from this process. In terms of the heat wave forecasting, um, we use the Bureau of Meteorology algorithm, which is the excess heat factor. Um, and that was developed by Nan and Corset. Uh, it runs models daily and produces a three day um, forecast. You can actually use the app to target specific locations. Um, and then, if need be, the idea is that you send out an SMS to that area and say, follow the DHHS guidelines on heat waves and uh, protect yourself. Unfortunately, since we started in October 2015, Tasmania hasn't had heat waves. So we haven't actually implemented that component, but it's ready to go should we need to. So. In terms of feedback and people's thoughts on the app, that's been fairly important to us. And um, we've conducted three online surveys um, with the registered users and, and the um, study participants. Um, we like to track how symptoms have changed from baseline to um, current times. We wanted to get basic information on how the users uh, were actually using the app. You know, did it change behavior for them over time? Um, and the sort of early feedback actually assisted in different uh, versions um, of the app being developed so that um, we could incorporate um, other ideas. We did provide a grocery voucher incentive um, to, to get feedback. So it was only $25, it wasn't, it wasn't much. We weren't burning people. In terms of some of the actions that have resulted um, from the using the um, aerator app, app and system, um, the first um, three, one to three months of use, um, we found that most people sort of changed their behavior or their environment. What we found interesting was sort of going to the next second survey at eight to 10 months of use, people were actually discussing their data with their doctors. And so that was really informative and that was really um, interesting to us because, you know, they're using it as a tool to understand the health and trying to self-manage um, that process. Um, and that um, people were much more aware of the, the environment and the impact that it was having on them. Um, we just finished the third evaluation, so I haven't finished the analysis for that yet. So apologies for not including that. In terms of feedback, we have one sec, one question. Do you have any other comments about aerator? And so, so it's mostly positive, I have to say. Um, and so just wanted to give you some examples of, of how people feel about the app and the process. Um, if people are interested in how you could maybe implement the um, aerator system and, and the app into different regions. Um, the biggest, I think, issue would be the pollen at this point. Um, it's, it's obviously very manual, quite expensive, um, and a, a little bit challenging, but we are working towards um, alternative solutions. Um, a lot of the data flow um, is coming from key partners like EPA Tasmania and BOM. Um, so that side of it, uh, we feel is, is fairly regulated, very easy to, for us to manage. Um, we would also probably have to determine for the app itself whether there were adaptations that would be required. Certainly running out to Northern Territory, there's a lot of interest in outdoor workers and fly and fly out and their heat stress. And so whether there would be ways to adapt the app to support them. Um, we, we feel like we've been through a couple of iterations with the app, and so we feel like it will probably be minimal changes needed. And then the other component really is developing a suitable communication plan and work with the partners to recruit and get uptake for the app. So kind of thought through the different processes. Um, in terms of where next for the environmental health group, um, there are plans to expand um, aerator, um, we have an ARC linkage application in to go to Northern Territory and ACT, so to, that'll primarily be Canberra and Darwin. Um, we have uh, an application in 
to do some work in Victoria, um, primarily on the PM2.5 sort of smoke, where the people's perception of smoke and their symptoms uh, line up. Um, and we're just about to start negotiations with WA to think about a health study that we could use the aerator app as a kind of an intervention in some form. Um, the research that um, we're involved in with the environmental health group, just out of interest for other um, people in the audience. Um, Faye is the lead on the, the infant component of the Hazelwood Health Study. Um, it's the early life follow-up um, study. So we've recruited over 500 families that were either pregnant during the Hazelwood Conway fire, uh, had a child under two, or the control group is that they weren't exposed at all. At all. Um, and so those families have completed a baseline survey. And so at the moment we're doing clinical assessments of the infant's uh, lungs and blood vessel. And um, going forward, we'll do some soil and dust characterization in their homes to understand if they're still, if their homes were exposed to the, the mine emissions, the fire emissions. Each month, um, families are reporting on whether the children have you know, ear infections, lower respiratory tract infections, things like that. And that's been going on since August. And there was pretty good re retainment. And I think last month we sort of started to see a little bit of a drop um, in the response. And we'd like to keep people going for at least a year. So we're going to try and work up a, you know, some enthusiasm to keep going. And we just got approval for all of the data linkage um, for Victoria. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, the plans are for an emissions testing facility to be developed. Um, so they've selected the site and uh, got permission to, to sort of go ahead with the um, building. And so next is sort of the build and install and get the funding um, and to move that forward. Um, and I think the, the primary interest, I think, for Faye really is to understand uh, improvements in Woodstock technology. Um, some of the work that she presented previously. Uh, at this seminar was uh, about improving people's ability to burn wood efficiently and reduce emissions and things like that. So um, I think she'd like to engage more on that. And one of the projects um, that I'm hoping we can collaborate with Niwa on is um, an indoor and outdoor residential indoor air quality study um, to evaluate three different interventions. At the moment, the Department of Health and Human Services provides guidance um, during smoke events to the public to say, close your doors and windows, um, or put your air conditioning on recirculation. And so their interest is to sort of understand it, how successful that really is. Um, and then what I had done in Canada, we had used a portable air cleaner with a HEPA filter, and had shown some success with reducing PM2.5 um, levels in homes by about 60%. So, we're adding that in as, a, as an intervention as well. And we're going to ask um, the householders to track their symptoms over the course of the project, which will be about a month in total, um, just to see if there's any differences um, in their, their symptoms as a result of that. So the, uh, the um, environmental health group is, is pretty large. Um, we collaborate with a lot of different people. And um, I just wanted to sort of acknowledge all of their hard work and effort. Thank you. Any questions? Thanks very much, Amanda. We have time uh, for some questions from the room or from our online viewers. Does anybody like to uh, have a question for Amanda? Yeah, so um, the individuals can report, I think, 20 times for one particular symptom to see if there's an association and uh, we can then figure out that we can say that right, this situation is going to be coming up, this is what's caused you problems in the past and send them an alert. It is. No. Yeah. I mean certainly uh, if we know that there is a uh, Plan burn that's causing excess levels of PM2.5. We can draw a line, or like a border around that area, and send an alert to people that we know have reported previously in that location, and so they can get a heads up. It's smoky. Do whatever you need to do. 
Um, so there's, there's two ways that you can send alerts. It's like you've got the bits of fish and stuff. Um, I think when you use a couple of the features, it does look okay. It does, yeah. And um, I think that's the, it's so much more localised, so that the wood smoke um, that is often missed um, and by the EPA sites. Um, so I think going forward, we're quite keen to see if we can develop other tools, so the app to sort of say to people, can you smell smoke, can you see smoke, um, so that we can include that as a, a, a risk as well. Should you go through the maintenance of health, the zero risk, because we're committing to a major highway? Um, going too far? Yeah, I mean, I think that the in Tasmania, the issue PM 2.5 is predominantly around smoke. Um, but I think as you move into the bigger urban areas, say Melbourne, Sydney, you know, that proximity issue is going to be important to capture. Presumably, when they mark a symptom, it points out to a certain PM 2.5 ratio, quality, and so forth. Can you then look back on that data? They look at everybody and then you can find out when M2.5 reaches a certain threshold where you start seeing an increase in the amount of reporting symptoms. Yeah. So you can actually then go back to the analyzer data. Yeah. yeah, and that certainly was early on. We found that we had set the thresholds for the pollen to be 100 is high, and the reality was 50 was actually high. So we actually changed our alert levels down. So yeah, it's it's definitely you can go back and forth on that. Yeah. I was just wondering about the um, the use of the trade like the percentage of what goes to at the start and then it gets to the event um, yeah. after a few weeks of the sort of of uh, drop off quite a bit. Or is it, it hasn't, but I I feel like. If you're using it, you're sick, you, you've got an issue, you've got a problem. And so you're motivated to figure out what that problem is. And so I think you do have, it's a different audience than your regular gamer on a, you know, gets an app for two weeks and goes, yeah, I've got to level six, I'm done. You know, so I think it is, it's a very different audience. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> your graphs seem to point out the fact that once they've used it a while, they start medicating before the symptoms. They look, it shows that they actually, your bar charts yeah. indicate that they were actually medicated before the symptoms. Yeah. So yeah, so yeah, that's yeah, you're kind of going a bit circular. So yeah. But uh, you know, I think if we can help people self manage, I think that's definitely useful. It's so at the moment it's creaking. Um, so it's um, the plan with CSIRO's involvement is to increase the um, modelling component and add in um, sort of fill in those gaps a little bit better. But yeah, it's it's um, yeah, it's kind of coarse at the moment. That's the hope, yeah. And so that's kind of where the, the new grant application is going. Are there any questions online? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Amanda. I'd just like to make a final plug for uh, keep out a uh, look on the International Wood Smoke Researchers Network website, where firstly uh, Amanda's talk will be uh, kept, uh, along with our archive of uh, a growing archive of, of previous talks, and there'll be more to come in the future. But for now, uh, I'd like to thank you, uh, Amanda. Thank <laughs> you.